to consider this report by UN Women, Progress of the World's Women 2015-2016, Transforming Economies, Realizing Rights. And the focus of the report is very much on economic and social rights and equality and substantive equality, about which we'll be hearing more in a moment. It comes at Beijing Plus 20, that being the fourth World Conference on Women in uh, 1995, and at a salient point where the agenda moving forward to sustainable development is uh, gaining additional momentum. Uh, so we have a terrific panel. Let me introduce them in the order in which they will be speaking. Shara uh, Bazavi, who is the chief of the data and research section of the Women, and in fact was research director for this project, uh, will be speaking first. Uh, following her is our own Professor Sandy Kerman from the Oxford Human Rights Health, director of our program, of course. And then last but not least, we're very pleased to have Justice Kate Regan with us, former Justice of the Constitutional Court of South Africa. Each of them will speak for 15 minutes or so, and then there will be plenty of time for questions and discussion thereafter. So, shall we continue? Thank you very much. To, within the dissemination um, efforts for the report, we have tried to interact also with academics who are a very important constituency for the kind of reports that we produce, since they help us write and provide the content for many of these reports, but also with students who are um, postgraduate students, undergraduate students, who will be uh, obviously uh, the ones who will be shaping minds and shaping policies. That's how we see it, and we see them as important uh, sort of change agents, as we call them. So it is really a pleasure. Um, and I don't know if you've seen a copy of the report. It's a very thick report. I obviously have to be very schematic and summarize a lot of what is in the report. So do excuse me if uh, it comes out as being a little bit overgeneralized and crude. I'll be very happy to provide some elaboration of the details and the nuances. Uh, beyond the sort of big headlines that I'll have to rely on in doing the presentation. Um, so I think it's important to sort of contextualize this report. We call it a flagship report. I don't know if you are familiar with similar flagship reports of other UN agencies and other organizations. For example, the World Bank has the World Development Report that comes out every year. Uh, the UNDP Human Development Report Office has the Human Development Report that comes out every year. And this is uh, Progress of the World's Women, is the report of UN Women. And prior to UN Women being formed um, a few years ago, it was a report that was launched by UNICEF, which was one of the organizations that in 2011 got merged into UN Women, because there were several institutions within the UN system that were looking at gender issues, and they were merged to create UN Women in 2011. UNICEF was one of them. And Progress of the World's Women was launched initially in the year 2000, and the author of that report was Diane Elson, who is a very well-known uh, feminist economist who works at the interface between economics and human rights, and she's based at the University of Essex. And also very much involved with the Women's Budget Group that does a feminist analysis of macroeconomic policies in the UK. I'll say a little bit about their analyses later on. Um, so, so let's just locate uh, our report within a kind of historical moment, if you like, coming 20 years after the very historic kind of conference in Beijing that developed a platform for action that still to this day many would see as a very forward-looking agenda uh, involving and elaborating on a number of interrelated dimensions of human rights and of women's rights um, uh, in, in, in that platform. Also in 1994, the Beijing conference took place in 1990. Uh, five, sorry. And in 1994, there had been a very important conference uh, in Cairo that was looking at uh, sexual and reproductive health and rights. And that conference came out again with a very progressive agenda for its time. And it remains still um, at the forefront, I think, to this day. And the year prior to that, 1993, was the Vienna Conference on Human Rights, which also was in many ways a landmark because it marked the importance of seeing women's rights as human rights. And this was, again, an issue that was very well elaborated in that conference. So coming 20 years after all those conferences, in this report we look at uh, 
you know, what has happened, how much progress have we seen, where is there regress, where have we stagnated and why. And we put the spotlight in particular on social and economic rights. And that's why this is kind of the focus of the report. But within our conceptual framework and within thinking about women's rights and women's social and economic rights, we very much emphasize the indivisibility of rights and the fact that there can be no social and economic rights without the right to elaborate it, to organize around it, to contest policies. So the civil and political rights are really inseparable from social and economic rights. Otherwise, you have very top-down planning um, of so-called social and economic rights that may end up you know, infringing on, on people's rights and practice. So that's a really important point to bear in mind. So let me begin with the kind of story that, that, that we have, which is basically saying that in terms of formal equality and legal rights, there has been a lot of progress over the past 20 years. And here we use uh, some of the data that has been put together by uh, Mala Chung and Laurel Welder, which is based on a sample of about 80 countries that they have, where they're looking at detail at the kind of laws that have been put in place between uh, their time frame is 75 to 2005. And we see quite a number of countries increasingly putting in place <coughs> laws um, that uh, disable, if you like, workplace discrimination. Also, increasing number of countries that are putting in place more positive laws in terms of provision of family leave, uh, of uh, parental leave in particular, and paid maternity leave. The paid maternity leave is the one at the top, and the parental leave at the bottom, obviously starting with a smaller number of countries, but picking up. And also uh, policies on, in terms of childcare provision. Uh, there has also been, which is not shown here, but we have a lot of data in the report, quite a lot of progress in terms of women's access to education, to the point where globally, at the primary level, the gender gaps in education have pretty much closed. There are, of course, big issues remaining in terms of the quality of education, but still, in terms of just numbers, in terms of enrollment rates, there has been quite significant progress. Um, so the question we ask is really, given, given all this progress that we have seen, uh, in terms of legal restrictions being removed on women's access to paid work, uh, also in terms of uh, access to social security being made uh, more um, equal in terms of laws, in terms of provisioning of those uh, social security uh, entitlements. Uh, how come in practice women continue to be systematically slotted into jobs and livelihoods that provide lower pay and remuneration? And we will have some data to show that. Uh, surely it's not just a matter of choice. If it was a matter of choice, it would have been much more random. But if systematically women are slotted into low-paying jobs, there must be something else there that's going on. Uh, and also we ask how come, despite all the attempts at making equal uh, in terms of law, the provisioning of social entitlements, how come women are still overrepresented amongst those who lack uh, access, full access to social protection measures? Things like pensions, like unemployment benefits, uh, family benefits, um, uh, as well as use of social services, and I'll have a little bit more to say about that. So equality before the law and equal opportunities in terms of access to education don't seem to be enough in enabling women to claim equal rights in practice, and certainly not enough for achieving substantive equality, which uh, in the definition of this report we use the CEDO definition, which is the concrete and equal enjoyment of rights. So it's not just about having equality in law, but also the actual enjoyment of rights in practice. Um, and this is kind of the framework uh, for substantive equality that uh, we developed um, um, sort of in this figure based on a very important background report that uh, Sandra Fredman and her co-author Beth Goldblatt uh, wrote for us as one of the key background documents to this report, which, which set out the framework. And I don't want to go into the details of this because Sandy is going to do that much more um, eloquently than I can. But bear in mind the point that I made about regressing socioeconomic disadvantage just being one dimension of the issue, and that in tandem we need to be thinking also about not only strengthening an agency voice and participation, which is about uh, sort of political and civil rights, if you like, but also addressing stereotypes and social norms that are discriminatory. Um, and this is a very important part when you get to uh, sort of realizing gender equality and for women to enjoy equal rights in practice. That very often these discriminatory social norms can be huge blocks in uh, disabling uh, the enjoyment of equal rights. 
Now, the international human rights framework uh, in general, and CEDAW in particular, do provide uh, very important sort of pointers that we have drawn on in thinking through some of the elements of our report. Uh, one is the recognition of the limitations of formal understanding of equality, um, that I'm sure many of you are, are very familiar with. Uh, it recognizes also that translation of formal into substantive equality can be hampered by what, what are called structural constraints, you know, historical disadvantages, uh, and this applies to gender as much as it applies to race, to class, to caste, to other ways in which societies are segmented and in which uh, equality is constantly uh, constrained. Uh, entrenched power inequalities that come with those historical um, disadvantages, as well as uh, very often discriminatory social norms. That are and stereotypes that are constantly reproduced, not only by uh, sort of institutions, but also by individuals, by societies. Women among them very often, uh, you know, um, are themselves often sometimes uh, reproducing those discriminatory social norms, and then one needs to be very alert about that. Uh, therefore, I mean, I think there is this recognition that within CEDAW that we don't have a kind of level playing field out there, which is often the assumption that is made. Uh, especially within economic thinking and economic policies, uh, that there isn't a level playing field out there. And for societies to be able to produce equal outcomes, they have to be cognizant of the inequalities in societies, of the blocks, of the, of the disadvantages, um, of the barriers that particular groups face. I mean, in this report, we're obviously very concerned about the barriers that women in particular face. And that, you know, discrimination is not just about direct discrimination, it can also be indirect and unintended. And, and I think those who have the idea of discrimination being indirect and unintended, we found very useful in terms of thinking about economic and social policies. So let me move on to the sort of second chapter of the report that looks at work, both paid work, employment if you like, as well as unpaid work, you know, the work that goes into reproducing people, care work, domestic work, a lot of the work that is done on an unpaid basis within households and communities. And from time use surveys, we know that it's women in all societies, you know, including Sweden, um, where women do the bulk of this unpaid work. And this, while it's being essential, it's, it's absolutely essential for any economy and any society to function and reproduce itself, it also acts as a, as a disadvantage, as a barrier to women being able to sort of seize uh, opportunities. Um, and I think as women, as you know, when we're younger, we're not very, maybe very aware of some of these barriers. And when you move into other parts of your life when you do have young children or you have elderly parents who need care and you do want to provide that care, I think it becomes very obvious that there are certain trade-offs and if society is not willing to change other institutions to accommodate uh, these other needs and other important rights of people, the right to give care and to receive care, then this can become a barrier to equality in practice. And it's not just a barrier for women, but also for increasing numbers of men, young men, older men, who are you know, providing care for children, for elderly parents, for friends, for neighbors. So it's an important barrier to bear in mind. Now when we look at uh, sort of labor markets, and these are based on very careful kind of data analysis that the statisticians in our team uh, did, um, what we see at the global level is when we look at labor force participation rates, Despite the fact that increasing numbers of, of women in different regions are joining the labor force, still overall we have like a 26 percentage point difference between men's and women's labor force participation rates. This is a global average. In some regions the gap is much bigger. Like in the Middle East and North Africa region you have much bigger gaps. In Sub-Saharan Africa you have very small gaps, gender gaps, because a lot of the women are actually you know, working in the labor force, uh, in agriculture uh, in particular. Um, and in countries like the US, you've had, and also some European countries, you've had kind of female rates that increased but are now kind of stagnating. They're not increasing any further. The gap is not closing any further. And when you look in detail at the age groups where the gap increases, it's very often what is called around, you know, it's called the childhood penalty, the motherhood penalty that comes when women start having children. That's when you see the gap widening. Also, when you, when you look in terms of access to sort of decent work, to work that pays a good wage, that provides access to social protection, again, women tend to outnumber men in terms of uh, being in sectors and types of work that don't provide the full gamut of entitlements and relatively decent work conditions. 
So in many developing countries, a lot of what women do is informal work or work that does not have the benefit of social protection. And even, uh, you know, let me just give you a kind of data from OECD countries, even though women make up something like 44% of the labor force uh, in general, uh, but something like two-thirds of workers uh, who are on what is called involuntary temporary contracts, i.e. workers who don't want to be on temporary contracts, but are on those contracts because they cannot find proper uh, full time and uh, contracts with social protection, two-thirds of them are women. Uh, so there you see again a bias in terms of who ends up doing this kind of involuntary and temporary contract work. Then when you look at gender wage gaps, uh, again we find for globally the average is something like 24% difference in men's and women's wages. Uh, and when you look at the details, uh, much of this gap cannot be explained by differences in so-called human capital. It's not because women are less educated. And in fact, as education rates emerge, <coughs> Uh, we have not seen the same convergence in terms of wages. So there's something else going on there. And economists keep on doing research and trying to find out, and they keep on saying, well, if it's not education, maybe it's some other human capital aspect that is that can explain the wage gap. Wage gap. And I think there's some problems in that debate. Uh, and there are ways in which women's labor keeps on being defined as less valuable than men, and sectors in which women work tend to be defined as less valuable. Um, and I think this is something that the other panelists can say uh, uh, much more about. So let me leave it there. But also when we look at unpaid work, again, it's not equally divided. Women, on average globally, do something like two and a half times the amount of unpaid work that men do. Um, so this is, again, quite significant, uh, because this is the kind of work that does not have monetary rewards, but as we keep on emphasizing, is absolutely the rock bottom foundation of any economy. No economy can function without this kind of work being done. Um, so there is something going on here uh, to talk about indirect discrimination, that despite some of the uh, important progress that has been made in terms of letting women enter into sectors uh, that are open to men as well, despite the fact that we don't have many of the restrictions that we used to have you know, in the old days in terms of married women not being able to work or women not being able to do night work or women being excluded from other types of work, while those barriers have gone, some of these inequalities are still in place, and there must be something else, you know, structural barriers um, that, and, and discriminatory social norms that are embedded within markets that, that create these inequalities, and that's what this little chapter of the report elaborates. So let me now move on to another area of the report, and that's the chapter three, where we look at social policies um, and why these are important. Now, if you look at market-based incomes, Market-based incomes produce significant inequalities in terms of gender. Um, but very often, social policies help to reduce some of that gap. Um, so for example, uh, I don't have the data here, but in the report there is a table that shows uh, the gap between men's and women's earnings uh, pre and, uh, sort of pre-tax and transfer compared to women's income as a share of men's income post-tax and transfer. What you see is that um, as a result of tax and transfer systems, that gap is reduced in many countries. So, so these social policies do perform uh, a sort of important function in terms of redressing some of the inequalities of markets. Um, and um, they're very important to keep them, that, that we kind of continue to finance them and make sure that they enable the kind of, um, uh, they provide the kind of entitlements that are necessary to close gender gaps, but also other gaps, gaps in terms of uh, income inequalities between social groups, for example, between different income groups, are also sometimes narrowed as a result of these social policies. But let me just show you some data uh, why we say, for example, investment in water and sanitation. This is an absolutely important investment in order to reduce the amount of time that goes into doing unpaid uh, work for the household. A lot of women in, in, in poorer countries, especially in poorer in income groups, in remote rural areas, spend a lot of time carrying water, for example, carrying um, firewood. And this takes out a lot of time from what could have been spent on either earning an income or just on doing self-care or having some leisure time. So it's an important investment. And investments in this area are lagging behind. And let me show you why in particular we think it's an important investment from a gender equality perspective. Here we did some analysis based on time use data. And what you see is that uh, if you add up the amount of time that goes into uh, collection of water, 
uh, in sub-Saharan Africa, uh, in households that don't have access to piped water. If you look at who's doing most of this work, it's very clear something like 71% of that is done by women and girls, and something like 29% done by men and boys. So it's an investment of this sort in infrastructure is, as we say, very gender responsive, because it's in particular women and girls who spend a lot of time on doing this. So it's important to have the resources in order to make these investments. And I emphasize this point because it's going to come back, come back again when we look at macroeconomic policies. So it's important from a gender equality perspective for governments to be raising the resources in order to make these investments because they have a particularly positive impact you know, from uh, the point of view of gender equality. But let me also look at a, a dimension of social policy that is not just for developing countries, but also an issue in more sort of advanced um, economies, and that's in terms of pension systems. Now, pension systems, contributory pension systems, very often kind of mimic, if you like, the inequalities that are created in the labor market, because the size of your pension and the ability to claim a decent enough pension is very often linked to how much time you contribute to doing paid work. Uh, very often pension systems reward work in the formal labor market and reward those who have continuous careers, who don't take off time to care for others, who don't work part-time or informally. Basically, a kind of bail breadwinner model, working full-time, lifelong, throughout the life cycle. If you meet that requirement, you get a decent pension within a contributory pension system. If you leave and come back in because you have a child or uh, you, know, you have to take care of an elderly parent or uh, whatever, um, then that basically works to your disadvantage. You're penalized in terms of your access to a decent enough pension when you reach old age. And here, there was some analysis that was done uh, based on the Chilean uh, contributory pension system that basically shows why women and men start, uh, if they start with a pension of that is equal, of 338 US dollars, this is just, and then they look at data on things like labor force participation, differences in wages, differences in time taken out, uh, and differences in life expectancy. What you end up is that a woman ends up with 114 US dollars as opposed to a man's 338 dollars because of the way in which breaks in career, lower wages, higher life expectancy, effectively work to penalize them in terms of the size of their pension system. So this is again another very good example of indirect discrimination. Pension systems don't intend to hurt women, but they end up hurting women because of the assumptions that are made within a pension system that basically devalues work that is unpaid, uh, the fact that some people have to combine paid and unpaid work over their life cycle, uh, so yeah, they end up basically penalizing people who have that kind of uh, more of a female career trajectory. And this could also apply to a man who ends up leaving the labor market you know, to care for a child or to care for an elderly parent. Uh, a man who's slotted into sort of uh, female-dominated jobs and earns a lower wage, you know, uh, who may be a teacher as opposed to being um, an engineer. Uh, so the biases can also work against men if they happen to be following that kind of female, uh, if you like. Uh, career kind of model. And let me end with my final slide that's on macroeconomic policies, and I won't go into it because macroeconomic policies are a very technical area, um, which um, I'm not a macroeconomist, so I'm, um, we have a, a very good feminist macroeconomist who uh, wrote this chapter of the report. <coughs> Again, macroeconomic policies are a very good illustration of policies that don't directly intend to hurt women or lower income households, but they often end up doing so because of certain assumptions that are built into them. And here, let me just illustrate very quickly by talking about sort of austerity policies that are going on uh, in many countries, you know, including in the UK. But in the UK, the advantage is that we have uh, the UK Women's Budget Group, and you can go to their website, they have amazing data that they put there, and analyses of government budgets, and how they have inbuilt biases, you know, against lower income households, against women, within the assumptions that are made in, in the kind of cuts that are currently being made in, uh, in uh, fiscal policy terms in this country. And what basically, uh, what we see is that uh, if we look at what's happening in Europe, but also when we look at you know, countries like the UK, the cuts that are being made are, are in particular hurting the households in which women are the single earners, I think I don't have the data here, but something like um, a 34% reduction in income if you happen to be in a, a household that is headed by a woman with children uh, as a result of the fiscal cuts in budgets, the kind of benefits that have been cut 
after those women, but also single pensioners, women single pensioners have also been hurt uh, significantly. Whereas if you compare that to households where you have two parents and uh, no children, the kind of cuts that they've seen in their income is something like 4.5% compared to the single households being hurt by around 35% in their in income tax. So you see the kind of differences um, in terms of who's actually bearing the costs of these kind of uh, provisions. And what we really like to emphasize here in terms of macroeconomic policies is that rather than having sort of growth and inflation redu reduction as the main objective of macroeconomic policies, if we rethink macroeconomic policies as should be about enhancing rights, enhancing everyone's human rights, then there's a kind of difference in, in which uh, the way we think about monetary policy and fiscal policies. And we think that human rights do provide a kind of different um, set of normative uh, principles for making macroeconomic policies. And there are some very interesting principles taken from the human rights uh, conventions that can guide that kind of policy making. For example, there's this obligation to respect, protect, and fulfill human rights, which puts, a, puts the onus on the state to be actually protecting human rights from the infringement of market forces as well as others, but also fulfilling them when the market system does not do it on its own. If the market system does not give people access to decent housing, then obviously the burden falls on the state to fulfill that right, and it has very policy instruments to do that. So I'll leave you with these principles, which I think can be very helpful in terms of rethinking macroeconomic policies, and if there is time, I'll say a little bit on what that would mean in terms of monetary and fiscal policies. So I'm going to leave you there and hand over to the next speaker. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, now, Sandy Frederick. of 
uh, getting rid of actual legal, explicit legal impediments, which of which there still are many in the world. Uh, for example, the UN, um, sorry, the World Bank Women in Business report, which also just came out, um, shows that there are only, I think, 11 countries in the world which have no legal impediments to women. So there are still many ways in which we've got to achieve equality before the law. But as we've seen, and, and Shara's presentation made it clear, bringing equality, getting equality before the law really is not enough, and all kinds of social inequalities remain. So there are other ways of understanding formal equality, so it is a little bit ambiguous, but another way is to say, which is a similar, is that we need to treat likes alike, and most importantly, that sex is an irrelevant characteristic and instead we should look at individual merit. That's why I've got this picture of the car wash. It's almost like if you just wash off all this prejudice, stereotype, then everything will be fine. It's just a matter of not of seeing sex as an irrelevant characteristic and from then on we will expose individual merit and everybody can be equal. Um, and, we've, and that's why I say it's the frustration, because working with this um, over many years, we found that inequality persists. And I thought I would just put up also the um, more economic way of understanding for equality, economist way, which is very crude, as I'm not an economist, but um, Shara also mentioned that, that it's, it's something about trying to look at differences in outcomes which cannot be attributed to difference in productivity enhancing characteristic. And many of the economic measures that you see use this definition, which actually makes invisible a whole swathe of structural inequality. So if we're going to move beyond this um, idea, uh, what are the problems with it? So some of the problems, these are familiar problems to everyone here sitting in this room, which are that um, you can treat likes alike at any level. So you can actually treat everyone equally badly. And one of the things that comes out of the report is that some of the narrowing of the wage gap is because men's wages have come down. So we don't really want equality to be seen to be furthered in that sort of a, a policy. Um, also, it's problematic because it seems to assume that there is some kind of abstract merit, which has got nothing to do with your previous disadvantage. So what we know for sure is that treating people with antecedent disadvantage alike might just reinforce that antecedent disadvantage. So we need to get beyond this definition. And what are the candidates? And this is, it's really trying to build up. The four dimensions are really trying to draw on the best characteristics of what the other candidates are. And... Um, balance out the, the weaknesses. So one of them is equality of opportunity, and that's the picture of trying to bring everyone up to an equal starting point. And what we say is we recognize antecedent disadvantage can lead to differential outcomes. So let's equalize the starting point, and then we can treat everybody on merit. Or we could look at equal outcomes, which is we look at who actually wins the race. So I, I like this combination because the black man and the white man start the race and the black woman wins. <laughs> but, um, um, but anyway, um, these are actually ambiguous terms when you look at them a bit more closely because I think it came out very clearly that equalizing the starting point is often really not plausible. So even though we might have equalized education for, for girls and boys, we still find that um, there is a, a lack of equality. Um, it could be a really radical view. It could say we have to act to make sure that substantive resources are provided to bring people up to the, to the same start. But this is really often not what we think of as equal opportunities. We usually think of getting rid of old boy networks, equal opportunities policies, opening the doors. Um, equal results is very important because we shift onto what is the impact rather than the treatment. But the problem is that they can be very deceptive. So you might look like you've got more women in certain positions, but if you look hard and you find either that it's become feminized and the whole pay scale of that job has come down, we found that in catering management, for example, or 
um, you actually find that what's happened is that some women are able to enter into the structure because they are hiring uh, low paid women to do their childcare. So the structure remains the same, but there are some women who are able to achieve within it. So, particularly the equality of results does not take into account this very important point which comes up again and again in this report about the impact of home pay of unpaid work on paid work really. Um, so instead what I what what the framework does is instead of looking at equal opportunity and equal results, it focuses on whether there is actually a focus on redressing <coughs> advantage and the advantage of that are the formal equalities, you can't get a levelling down. Also for equal results and equal opportunity, you have to look harder to find what is the disadvantage and are you changing it. But even further you need to think about structural change. So that if you're going to change the, the, the reality of, of, of differential results, we're looking at changing the balance of the division of labour in the home, for example, which is a structural change, changing the structure of employment. Now, the other really um, favourite candidate for substantive equality is dignity. So, everyone loves dignity. But, um, <laughs> and certainly, the, both, and it's a very important, extremely important value um, in that. Much of what discrimination is about is just pure humiliation. It's about treating people as if they were not human. And this is what the Canadian Supreme Court captures. And the South African Court and Justice O'Regan has said a very eloquent in many judgments about this idea of fundamental human dignity. But dignity is also a simple concept. And what I've tried to do in a four-dimensional approach is to make it more specific. So many people say it's very vague. And that's why the second dimension talks about specifically stigma, stereotyping, prejudice and violence to try and pin down what it is we mean by dignity. Secondly, um, we found, this comes from Canadian jurisprudence, a kind of disconnect between dignity and socioeconomic disadvantage. So that if we, are, we get below our benefits, we didn't really mean to treat you with disrespect. We just wanted to incentivize you to get a job or go for training or whatever. So um, that means that the stigma part has to be allied with the addressing disadvantage. That's why it's a, a multi-dimensional approach. Um, and the other thing is it's often thought to be very individualistic. So I like to try and think of this in terms of Nancy Fraser's idea of recognition rather than dignity per se, which is how other people perceive you and how you are perceived in society. So it's a mutual, interactive understanding of dignity. Now you'll notice that all of this, so I've talked about redressing disadvantage, structural change, and stigma, stereotype, and prejudice, and violence. But actually, the, the candidates for substantive equality really have given almost no attention to the fourth part of the dimension, which is participation and voice. And this is something which is so crucial to being able to articulate what are the real concerns, what are the real needs of women and whoever it is we concern with in terms of equality. So that's the four dimensional approach which tries to bring all of these together, not in any sense of hierarchy, but as mutually complementary. So redressing disadvantage gets over the idea that we want to just wash the concrete, <coughs> it's about detriment, not classification. It allows you to take affirmative action because you are not saying it's wrong to treat people according to their characteristics, and it clearly doesn't allow leveling down. But it importantly needs to be allied with ideas of stigma, prejudice, stereotyping, and violence. And um, this is because, I think it comes out very clearly from what Shara said about this report, that a lot of the disadvantage that is most entrenched, so far as women are concerned, has to do with the background recognition problems that is undervaluation of women's work, women as being thought of as primary child carers, and, and women as sex objects, so harassment at work, violence against women, etc. So these two need to be seen together as mutually interactive. Um, participation, again, as I said, needs to be seen as its own 
complementary dimension, but this is not just political, but also social, and in the labor market. And we can come back to the point about agency, of course, because um, at least participation gives you the possibility of choice, but this framework doesn't put too much onto choice. We can talk more about that. Um, and then, of course, there's the question of um, transformation and structural change. So, as I said, we need to actually change the division of labor in the home, for example, thinking not just of maternity rights, but parental life rights, thinking of working hours in the home. And most of all, we need to think of the interaction between all of these different dimensions so that they are mutually um, supportive, but also where they pull in different directions. We need to take others into account, and I'll come back to that. So this is just very briefly seeing how this might work if you have the problem, which is the labor market, you have a pay gap, job segregation, precarious work, informal sector, all the things that Shara talked about. And then you think, well, what are the policies you could use? So if you looked at simply from the labor market point of view, you would look at redress and disadvantage, you look at equal pay for part-timers, rights for precarious workers, affirmative action. But you would also need to address undervaluation of women's work, harassment, and stereotyping. You'd have to improve participation, particularly in trade unions, and you'd have to transform our working hours, etc. Um, just a quick point about how they interact, and they might actually pull in different directions. So one of the things which has been very problematic, and Shara mentioned that social transfers have been an important way of equalizing or at least narrowing the gap. But yet, um, social benefits can also be stigmatized and reinforce stereotypes. And it's, it's quite surprising how many places still look at income as household income. So if we think of household income, we actually make entirely invisible the internal dynamics and homes between men and women. And social benefits can often be stigmatic. We know how demonized loan mothers are. So we need to make sure that if we are addressing disadvantage, we need to build that policy in a way that doesn't reinforce stigma. But on the other hand, if we stick, focus on stigma alone, we can leave the disadvantage untouched, as we saw in the case law. Um, again, we might stick with affirmative action, that's the redressing disadvantage. We might put quotas in, say, into Parliament, but unless we get do something about the underlying division of labor in the home that won't be sustained because the parliament sits all night, the parliament sits far from people's families. Women will start dropping out and that's what we've seen in just a couple of years. And similarly, um, women's voice must genuinely redress disadvantage. Um, and that's why I put in the Thatcher effect. But it's not enough just to have a woman there. We have to decide what it is that we can say. Now, I don't have time now, but I was going to just show you how this could work with... Um, should I just take two minutes? Or do you want to try? Okay, so I just wanted to show you how this work would work with analysing a particular policy, which is the policy of conditional cash transfer. This is becoming incredibly popular throughout the world. The, the background of it is that it's been noticed that poor women use money productively for their families. So if you give women the um, cash transfer, then they will, evidence shows, use it for their families, whereas men tend not to. And you've probably got the evidence of this. So what is the answer? Well, let's give the money to the women, <coughs> conditional on them taking their babies to baby clinics, and conditional on them go to school. So this looks very benevolent, and everybody at the moment loves these policies, they're spreading everywhere. But if we think about it, is it really furthering substantive equality for women? If we run it quickly through these stages, it will be, well, yes, it's redressing disadvantage in some ways, but a cash transfer can often be quite small. And um, often it comes with very onerous conditions. Sometimes it's community work, sometimes it's going a long way to clinics. And it may well not, it may reinforce stereotypes because it says the women are the ones who are going to look after the families and it's the men of the look. Um, and thirdly, very often these schemes, there are many different kinds, so I'm not generalizing, this is more a way of assessing them, are, do not include women in terms of their 
the way in which they are structured. And finally, um, it may well not bring about much by way of structural change because it doesn't change the quality of the clinical care, doesn't change the quality of the schooling. So if we want to think about it, we want to, and I think this report makes it very clear, we need good quality services, and if we're going to go for cash transfers, we may want to prefer unconditional ones. So that's really how we could use a substantive equality framework using these dimensions to change or modify the kind of policies that you use. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much. And our final speaker, um, Justice Everybody. Thank you. Well, I feel like a bit of an interloper because I haven't been involved in the report at all. And sort of like an education <coughs> judge, I think. And um, in reading the report, it reminded, made me feel like very often we look at a legal problem from the point of view of jurisprudence. It's a little bit like looking through a keyhole, it's a little room beyond. You know, you can't see the whole room, you see little bits of it, you're not quite sure, you know, how it relates to other parts of it. And when you read a report like this, you suddenly feel, now I'm looking at the whole room, I'm looking at really what we're looking at in this report is the interaction for the relationship between economic and social status of women between work, social policy, and macroeconomic policy. And generally, when we use law and we use, use jurisprudence to address those problems, we're only looking at one tiny, tiny aspect of one bit of it. So it, it made me reflect on um, the limits, certainly, of law and litigation and legislation to be able to see the whole room. It was very refreshing to read this report. Even in the many reports I've read over the years, I thought this was a, a really fine example of this with really sustained, thoughtful account of a very big picture. Um, I think really um, enhanced by this rich understanding of equality that, that Sandy's just outlined. And if you turn to the world of work, which in many ways is where I started off as a lawyer, as a labor lawyer, and a trade union lawyer in the 1980s, it struck me as to, we made a lot of progress. You know, if you look at the, if you look at the um, legislation that's outlined, <coughs> We now have 143 out of, I think, about 195 countries in the world that guarantee equality between men and women. Um, you have a very wide range of countries that have removed many of the barriers to women in the workplace. You have many countries that have introduced um, equal pay for work, equal value. Many countries have introduced um, legislation outlawing sexual harassment. So the legislative framework since Beijing, I think, as the report acknowledges, is very, very different um, to what it was 20 years ago. And yet, as Shara has shown, putting up the, the figures, we are still seeing a very significant lag in relation to women's participation. In fact, it's stagnated, really. Uh, since the 1990s, at around about 55% uh, uh, um, of women uh, in participation in the workforce. You've seen a persistent pattern of uh, women earning less than men. Um, the pensions being less than men. You, so you see that we've got now a fairly good legislative framework in many, many countries, but we're actually not seeing the change um, underpinning it that you might have imagined. And I think that it is true that, I'm going to talk a little bit about macroeconomic stuff in a moment, it's true that macroeconomics and social policy are factored there, but I think what we haven't really grappled with enough are social norms. And the, and the unbelievable persistence of social norms and the, um, the uh, impenetrability of social norms by, by legal techniques. They, I, I think all of us from kind of all parts of, the, parts of the world could probably produce an example, possibly even from your own family setting, of a social norm that has persisted despite possibly quite a wide spread commitment to the idea that men and women should be treated equally, that men and women are e citizens of equal work. Yes, I think about my own family. I, mean, I definitely do a heck of a lot more washing up than most of the male members of my family. Um, it's just, just how it is. Now, why does that persist? Why does it persist in all your, in all your families and settings? And let's not be, uh, let's be realistic that, in fact, it is these, this persistence of social norms that is one of the major constraints on changing the patterns between in relation to men and women. And I think law uh, is not particularly helpful in that regard. And, and I was talk about economics because what is very interesting to me, and I'm really not an economist, so this is highly unimportant commentary, but 
I was very interested by the fact that you looked at macroeconomics. Um, but I want to start by saying that although I think macroeconomics is important, possibly more important than law, it's still not going to address the social norm issue, which I think is so, so endemic and so persistent. But what I really liked about the macroeconomics is that coming at it from a lawyer, and the lawyer's grapple for social and economic rights in particular, is that it started at least putting questions up about the way that we think about macroeconomics. And of course, one is seeing that coming through from, from even people who would consider themselves to be uh, economists in the mainstream, like Joseph Stiglitz, a, a capitalist economist, undoubtedly, but beginning to ask questions about what are the goals of macroeconomic policy and starting to unpick this persistent, well, initially persistent commitment to low inflation levels post 1980s um, emergence of, sort of neoliberalism to the post 2008 um, increase in GDP. Um, to start asking questions about what is the space here for us to think about different kinds of considerations in, in macroeconomic goals. I thought the, the report was very good on that. It was also good to recognize that, so that's one big picture of thinking about macroeconomics, but something lawyers can be quite involved with is thinking about fiscal interventions. So really when it's talking there about tax in particular, the way in which tax structures, firstly, of course, generate um, generate resources for the state to spend on social policy, to do a range of other things, but also which may have ways in which they constrain behavior and encourage behavior. And I thought that maybe human rights lawyers ought to think quite a little bit more about fiscal policy. Um, and we, we know that there was quite a lot of thought at sort of equality levels early on about fiscal policy and taxation of, of the households and married women and all that sort of thing. But we've sort of taken on attention of that, and certainly I have over the last little while. Um, so I really, uh, I really applaud the report for dealing with a lot of that, and I can't assess it myself, but I think that this is, um, this is a focus that we should be bringing to bear on this, this overall picture. Um, I also, uh, I, there are a couple of last thoughts that I had. One was that I thought, and perhaps this is inevitable in the UN report, that the report masked, I think, a real social phenomenon, which is a, a big difference between some parts of the world's clear commitment to, um, to gender equality and other parts of the world. One of the interesting pieces of information that came out of the report, I thought, was a research which suggested that non-secular states, states where there was a close association between uh, religious associations and the state, were, were correlated with, let's be clear, not cause, but correlated with um, uh, poorer rates of measures of women's equality. So there seem to be something about non-secular states which produce that outcome. And I think that's a very uh, interesting question. But, but it, it, it struck me that um, if you looked, for example, at the, the data coming out of sub-Saharan Africa or Latin America, generally you can see significant improvements. Um, and you can see some of the same in South Asia and the East and North Africa. So I think that is a conversation that we, we need to have and be, be, be candid about. Um, and there was one other thing that I wanted to say. Just going to oh yes, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, the, the, the last thing to, that struck me very much. And it comes back really to where I started with the limits of the law. It was some of the information on segregated work, which is very well explored in the report. And it's particularly looking at this issue of the fact that women in the, in the established workforce do work that's less well paid and are trusted in jobs which are less valued and of course they do all both unpaid work and informal work, informal sector work <coughs> in the developing world. Um, and how difficult, even in, uh, there was an example that came from Norway, which you know, I always think of as, you know, kind of archetypal out there at the forefront of gender equality issues, where they had decided that they were going to use quotas to target um, uh, preschool teaching and try to reach a situation where after 15 years or 20 years they would have created 20% of men would be preschool teachers and 80% of women having started off somewhere around like many societies I imagine with well over 90% of preschool teachers coming from, uh, from being women. Um, and after 20 years they managed to get to 10%. And I just thought that it, it's back to this point about this, this intrinsicness, even in a society which in many really is very committed to gender equality, how, how, how entrenched it is, um, and how 
I do begin to wonder, I also wonder often, is this, should we, should we, should we be wanting parity everywhere? And I suppose the answer is that if we could get rid of the patterns of women earning 24% less, women being poor at the end of days, having less pension, then I don't mind if 100% of women are preschool teachers. You know, I don't really mind having job segregation if it doesn't track across into material disadvantage. But it's very hard to say that we shouldn't be concerned about those job segregation issues when, in fact, it does track across into, I think, established patterns of disadvantage. So thank you very much. I mean, the two of you, I know, and Shara particularly, but Sandy, she's something very important. I think it's a fascinating report. For those of you who haven't had a chance to read it yet, I, I highly recommend it. It's full of really interesting data. Well, thank you very much indeed. We now have time for questions or comments, and if I could maybe group together two or three. If you do have a question for a specific panelist, perhaps you could identify that particular question, not that prevents others addressing it as well. 